Welcome back to the Germ Club podcast. There are many reasons why people itch. To understand the ideology of the itch scratch cycle, we have the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Brian Kim, one of the top dermatologic researchers worldwide studying itch and inflammatory skin conditions. Dr. Kim is the director of the Mark Liebel Center for Neuroinflammation and Sensation and the vice chair of research of the Department of Dermatology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Formerly, he was co-director for the Center for the Study of Itch and Sensory Disorders at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Dr. Kim is really at the bridge of merging clinical and scientific excellence across dermatology, immunology, and neuroscience to transform how we treat patients who have itch and skin inflammation. Dr. Kim, welcome to the Derm Club podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you here today to discuss this topic. Uh, thanks for having me, Hannah. So let's just start off um, with very basic questions, but many that are can be confusing. What causes itch? Yeah, um, it's a very basic question. Um, there are essentially kind of two ways to think of itch. Um, but I'll start with the, the first way that's most obvious, which is that there's some kind of environmental stimulus that your skin is exposed to, uh, whatever that may be. It could be a chemical. It could be a, uh, some kind of mechanical stimulation, uh, but maybe even a change in temperature. But there's something that happens that triggers your sensory nervous system to feel and relay a very specific signal, which is itch. And um, there are lots of ways that we think that can happen. And we think that that can happen because your skin itself, the structure of your skin is somehow stimulated in a way uh, that may release a factor that causes your nerves to fire. Uh, it's probably also very possible. We believe that the nerve fibers themselves can directly get stimulated or the immune cells in your skin get stimulated uh, in a way. Uh, it, what we as dermatologists see most of is uh, our rashes. And we know the vast majority of rashes itch. So there's a lot of ways that itch is triggered from the outside. So that's the first uh, concept. The second concept though is, um, and in neurobiology, we refer to that as uh, extraception, where you're sensing things from the environment, but there's also interoception where you're sensing things internally, um, irregardless of even kind of the external stimulus. So uh, an example of that is that we also know that itch can be triggered uh, just by even the thought of itching, or say, I'm talking to you about this now, and you start to feel itching, or you see someone scratching, and then you feel itch and it, there's actually a contagious element to it as well which actually gets to kind of fundamental social behavior as well so like when you tell someone like oh i think i have lice and then they start itching their hair <laughs> exactly or you know we'll um when i see patients in the clinic and we realize the person has scabies and, and you know no one was wearing gloves and all this stuff and everyone all the providers in the room will start feeling itchy right so <laughs> Um, that's not really per se, I would say, you know, an external stimulus directly on the skin at all. Um, you can debate about what, you know, how external that is. Uh, but we think of that as there's some kind of internal process that's triggering that sensation, um, certainly probably from the brain. Okay. So it's really fascinating. Um, and there, obviously there's sensory manifestations that really induce this itch. Do we think that itch correlates with the severity of the clinical disease? Depends. Um, even in diseases like atopic dermatitis or eczema, which are essentially, it's a cardinal kind of chronic itch condition. The correlation is not as good as you'd think. So if you actually look at kind of correlation plots in terms of itch severity with what is, you know, what are metrics of disease severity, like the easy score or even um, the body surface area. It's, it's, not, it's not this perfect kind of correlative linear curve. Um, so uh, so I, don't, I don't think the correlation is as one-to-one -one as we think, um, but also 
you know, I think we need to understand that from the standpoint of a variety of different dermatologic conditions as well. So we, I don't think we fully understand it because there are lots of itches. There's lots of con inflammatory conditions that itch and how much they actually correlate in terms of objective disease to the subjective sensation of itch. That hasn't really been mapped out really that well. By and large, yes, but it's nowhere near what we think. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because I remember when I'm in the clinic, we would have patients often come in and they would say, I'm itching, I'm itching all the time, I can't stop. And you would like have to really, really look so closely sometimes at their skin to see like, I barely can even visualize a rash. So, or I, can't, I don't even see like a bite, like you, you're like looking for that, that finding and it's can be tr sometimes very tricky to find. So why is it sometimes that the itch is just much m worse than what is perceived on your skin? Yeah, well, I think for one, I think what we see is very limited. Uh, um, so I, th I think that, you know, it there's a lot that could go on under the skin in a very invisible fashion that is probably immunologically even very profound, but that our eyes just simply can't see. Uh, and, um, and so that's the first issue. And then the other issue I think is, is that we're, we're used to kind of as dermatologists classifying diseases that we know um, or that are well described. And, but the other issue is that there are lots of itch conditions that because we couldn't see them very well, we never actually classified or even looked close enough. And I would, I would even assert that a lot of my patients with what we refer to as kind of chronic pruritus of unknown origin. Um, if you actually look really closely, they'll have these little tiny micro papules that will look almost like a bug bite, um, but it's nothing like a bug bite because when we talk about bug bites, we, we use terms like papular urticaria, which are very big and obvious, uh, but you'll see these tiny micro papules that are so small little ping pongs that you would never notice. Um, and, and the people who actually notice it most are the patients and they'll point it out and they'll say it and they'll describe it. And, um, and there's really no classification for that really, even in dermatology, right? Um, well, essentially we think that's essentially a nothing, but I don't think it's a nothing because when we biopsy it, we'll see um, fairly consistently certain kinds of findings. Um, ironically that not or not ironically that resemble even bug bites in some ways. Um, so there's a lot I think that is going on that we can't see. I think there's a lot that we haven't characterized because we, we have a hard time seeing, not because we can't see, we could actually probably see some of these things if we look closer. Um, but I think also because it's such uh, an area that's unknown, a lot of people just you know feel a little bit paralyzed about really getting into to you know characterizing different itches and things like that right it can be and it's frustrating um, for both the patient and for the clinician uh, yeah. so you know it used to be like considered pain or it was on the pain scale is that how you look at itch or is that not an accurate way to really consider itch yeah, I don't really for a number of reasons. Um, you know, as a physician scientist, I always I always have two ways to look at things. And one is to look at something scientifically and the other is to look at it clinically. And the the the, lo the logic and the vantage points that you employ for those two different lenses are very different. But then they can kind of meet in the middle. And ideally what happens is that they meet in the middle and then there's an intersection that reveals a truth about the whole big picture. And I think when you're talking about itch, the first thing that I, I don't, on the clinical side, intuitively, that never really resonated with me about itch being a form of pain is that there are actually, generally speaking, somewhat mutually exclusive sensations by and large, like they can coexist but their coexistence is not typically what happens. So typically what happens is that you itch and you scratch to alleviate that itch. And that's a mechanical stimulation that can then verge in well into the realm of pain to suppress the itch. So essentially uh, employing kind of neuroscientific kind of uh, rhetoric, you, you can gate out itch with pain. 
So the idea that they're kind of the same symptom is, is a, wasn't exactly, didn't make a whole lot of sense just intuitively from, from that standpoint. Uh, now, what I'm saying is fairly imprecise even so, so you can still make an argument for why it's a, a, a mild form of pain. But the other issue is therapeutically. So if you think about therapeutics that are highly effective, that eliminate pain, actually don't do a good job of, of tackling it hardly at all, all right? Um, and if you look at the mu opioids, they in fact are associated with a fairly high incidence of itch itself, mm. severe itch. And it goes back to the idea that pain is somewhat actually itch suppressive. So when you actually eliminate all elements of pain, at least in a significant subset of patients, you actually by default promote itching. Wow. So, so I think there are a number of clinical um, more than anecdotes that suggest that that's not the case, but then you get into the science of it and you get into the neurocircuitry and the neurobiology of it. And there are clearly identified now molecular and likely cellular pathways that are by and large, pretty distinct from pain. So the, the idea that, you know, that they're completely overlapping is, is, you know, in many ways, the evidence is mounting that it's probably not the case at all. Um, so that has had major implications, actually. Um, you know, I think that in my personal opinion, I think the traditional paradigm that itch is a malformed pain held up itch research in some level, because I think by um, extrapolating from that logic, you would say, well, if you study pain deeply enough or well enough, you'll solve itch. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I think the fact that it's actually a parallel separate track in many ways indicates that that's not the case. And in fact, a lot of the way that itch, itch has kind of emerged indicates that, in fact, um, that's probably not the case at all. And, and then furthermore, itch biology in many ways is actually very, it does a lot of breadth to it. It actually may reveal a lot more about irritability in general. So there's lots of ways that your body is irritated. It's not just itch. And there's a multitude of itches, but you cough, you have the cough reflex, mm -hmm. so something irritates you, um, you'll have bowel irritability that's associated with inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, very serious diseases, diseases that are, affect more lifestyle like irritable bowel syndrome, high incidence, whole host of different functional irritability symptoms. Um, and then bladder irritability, there's conditions like interstitial cystitis, which we've kind of considered a pain disorder because it's uncomfortable. I, I tend to think maybe not, maybe the paradigm of itch is better suited to solving the therapeutic um, kind of gap in these conditions. So I think we have to now in turn also revisit a whole host of physiologies that are irritable and view it much from more from the sense of this, a lot of what the itch biology has laid out. Which is tricky because you're kind of like retraining how clinicians were taught it in medical school or a long time ago, we're like, we we're looking at it in a totally different way. You know, I don't think it's too tricky though, because uh, not a lot has been done in it. So it's not like, it's not like there are a lot of, you know, useful paradigms that we are married to about it. Uh, maybe it's something like antihistamines work, right? Like, uh, which is, not generally not true, but we're very married to that. But there aren't too many things like that in itch. It's, it's in a way, it's just been this kind of frontier that's just been uncharted. It's just largely been ignored. Uh, it's not like there are a whole, you know, there are fields in medicine where there's, there are kind of these like concepts that people hold on to and mm -hmm. they, they want to like combat anything that's iconoclastic. It just doesn't really have that. It's it was just kind of a blank slate, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. Where, where there, you know, we didn't really address it clinically or scientifically very well until very recently. Well, that's why we have you. So thank you for doing that job for us because I'm sure that you know this is like a as you said a relatively new area, and I'm sure in the next five, 10, 15 years we'll see a lot more um, uncovered and understand itch on a whole new scale. Yeah. Absolutely. It's exploding. It's yeah. it, the field is, is literally exploding right now. Um, so why is it that itch gets worse at night? Or I have an example of a patient who actually had proagonodularis and they were so itchy. It was uncontrollably itchy, like constant itch they, to the point where they like almost couldn't work. 
they yeah. they finally went back to work and they would tell us they would come in and they would say you know when i'm busy i am not itching and but as soon as i get home at night five o'clock rolls around and i and from five o'clock through the night i'm so itchy i don't know what to do with myself so why yeah. is it is that a behavioral um issue um can you explain that to us yeah i well i think what you're saying i think what you're almost implying and what you're saying and what your patient is saying, there's a huge amount of truth to that, is that uh, this, there's definitely no question an element of kind of higher cortical suppression. So you could actually suppress behavior associated with itch or maybe even tune, tuning it out a bit you're through thinking about other things, distracting yourself, being busy, being at work, um, or even unconscious stimuli, right? The, the, think about what the whole process that you had to get through to even get to work, the, 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 the multitude of stimuli that are, you're not even paying attention to from the light to the, you know, the stoplights to the noises and all that, that may actually serve to help suppress some of this kind of itch that now you're in, you know, you're at night, you're tuning all that out. And then now the itch kind of emerges. But I also fundamentally believe that the circadian rhythm is really important. And I think that, I do think there's a di diurnal element probably to it as well. And I, I think there's probably, the question is how much of that pie is comprised of cortical suppression and how much of that is comprised of just a natural rhythm of either the nervous system or even the immune system for that matter, or the barrier that's now resulting in this kind of amplification at night. It's really well known that scabies uh, itch is terrible at night. It's much, mm -hmm. much worse. Um, yeah, I don't think that, I don't know for a fact, but I don't think that's because there's unique mite behavior at night or something, you know, but it's, it's widely known um, that that's the case, but that's true of a lot of uh, people who itch. Right. You know, I, I was recently speaking to someone who um, told me about studies being done using virtual reality goggles um, to do like wound dressing changes. So they put the patient, the patient puts on virtual reality goggles while their wound um, is being treated in the clinic. And I just, I would, I'm sure it would be an interesting study where you put um, goggles on a patient and see if during that time their itch is suppressed or they don't notice it as much because they're distracted. Yeah, that's a good it's a good point. Yeah, that, that would be really interesting to know because yeah, you can of course visually, you know, control a lot. Right. So why is it, you know, you always say like, um, you, you say like, uh, you hear that like itching is like a vicious cycle. And when you itch, it only makes it itchier. It's like the itch that itches. So yeah. can you explain that to us? What, yeah. what that I mean, cycle is about? Yeah. Well, I, I think the itch scratch cycle itself is is a kind of a, a pathologic state. So we itch, I mean, you'll probably scratch yourself a certain amount of times throughout the day. And, and you know, even if you're, you don't have any disease and you don't have any pathology, um, I certainly do. And to some degree, that kind of itching is is probably helpful. It, it, it encourages some level of motility. It doesn't let you just sit, you know, catatonically you know still and that evolutionarily serves really well to to prevent things like infestations and infections with parasites right um we know that from scabies epidemics in nursing homes it's because people are immobile right uh if they were able to actually be much more mobile they'd be protected just from their their uh motility and mobility um so i think that there's some level where the itch scratch cycle really in a healthy individual is, is not, it's not really an issue, right? You, you can scratch an itch and it's fine. It's homeostatic. But I think in diseases like atopic dermatitis or particularly pyrigonodularis, I think what we're talking about is where it feeds forward. So an adapt, and as, as I mentioned earlier, is that scratching is a way to alleviate the itch. And then if you adequately stimulate certain nerve fibers, such as mechanosensitive nerve fibers, you can then gate out and suppress itch. The problem occurs is when you do that and all you do is feed forward. Now you just create more itch. You might just transiently and very momentarily alleviate the itch, but then it comes back with even more of a vengeance. There are a number of mechanisms that can drive that. Um, if you put on 
if I put on my immunology hat, the one thing is, is that you're scratching and tra traumatizing the barrier in a way that results in a release of a variety of factors, cytokines from the epithelium, proteases get released, whole host of different factors, maybe even neuropeptides get dumped onto these sensory nerve fibers. And then you itch. So now you're actually causing more damage to the barrier. Now you get more bombarding the nerve, you activate the immune system, more immune cells get activated. They produce a whole host of factors like cytokines that it cause itch and that feeds forward. So now you itch and then you do more scratching. Um, the other issue that's also interesting is there's a phenomenon called allonesis, where now because there's some pathology, underlying pathology, whether it's inflammatory pathology or even uh, uh, primarily neurogenic uh, pathology, is that the nerve fibers that actually serve to suppress itch and that in a healthy state are actually trying to suppress itch, essentially the wires literally get crossed where now mm -hmm. those nerve fibers start to trigger itch. And when they were, they're not really bona fide nerve fibers at all, but now they're triggering itch. So there's that phenomenon as well. So th that's another kind of sophisticated neurocircuitry layer to the itch scratch cycle. You get, you, there's lots of ways, there's lots of ways that this goes bad. Um, you know, and then in conditions like atopic dermatitis, what you'll find, especially to children, is they actually start to lose a lot of their pain sensation, superficial pain sensation. In fact, you'll see in the clinic, these kids come in with ulcers and bleeding. Mm. And just imagine if you did that to yourself on your normal skin, uh, you'd be miserable, you'd be stinging and burning and you, you wouldn't even want to move. And you see these kids come in on their atopic lesions with really you know dug in lesions and they're not complaining about any level of pain, they're just complaining about itch. So in some sense, they've kind of numb, anesthetized their pain fibers uh, in a way. That's also not good because of what I talked about, because you have mechanical stimulation that can gate out itch. You also have pain can get out itch. So now you're losing these things that are adaptive to suppress the itch uh, within the nervous system as well. So there's lots of ways that this can feed forward. Does that eventually come back? Like once you're able to get that balance back of like them not itching, are they, is that, are those like sensory fibers? They're like yeah. able to come back and be kind of normal again? Yeah, I mean, by and large, in atopic dermatitis, by and large, is a younger person's disease. Uh, for the most part, fortunately, because we have these really effective targeted therapeutics now, we're actually able to now draw some conclusions about what happens when you actually get back to healthy, right? All right. Uh, we just, we didn't live in that world before, but since around 2017, that all changed. And by and large, I'd say atopic dermatitis people you can bring them back, things come back. So there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of permanency to the pathology. Um, that's not everybody, but by and large. Um, and I, I, my personal kind of bias is that I think it's because it's largely a disease of younger, youngish people, and they're pretty healthy to begin with. But then there are other conditions uh, where I'm a little more skeptical about the reversal kind of restoration of you know, primary health again, um, particularly my patients with kind of pruritus of unknown origin. As you get older, a lot of these alterations are pretty, they're pretty dramatic and they're pretty irreversible, I think. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't think you can kind of bring the balance completely back. And I, and I, I think of itch as a pathologic kind of default mechanism. So if you look at the nervous system and the sensory nervous system, there are certain kinds of pathologic defaults that occur due to loss of healthy sensory processes. So I think mechanical sensation, touch, even a little bit of pain, these are all really healthy things that you want to experience. You actually lose that as you age. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, in your uh, oral mucosa, you can't feel food as well. And so it's not just as you get older, you have trouble swallowing and things like that. People think it's due to just simply poor dentition. dentition. It's not. There's also just how you process the food and massage the food. You lose that. Um, and it's the same it, way, like my grandma always says, I can't taste anything or she only tastes like the salt and something. It's the same, same type of thing. Exactly. You lose these very healthy kind of sensations. And then what happens is that you kind of select for these, actually these uh, pathologic sensations. So a, a good example is, you know, tinnitus ringing in the ears. 
big problem. I mean, huge problem. I was reading the articles. I don't know why, but some articles kind of get to you. And I was reading during COVID about the, uh, I think, Texas Roadhouse founder, Texas Roadhouse and CEO, who committed suicide because he he got kind of post-COVID complication, he ended up getting tinnitus. And I think it struck me because he's this kind of uh, Southern guy, uh, pulled him up from his bootstraps, kind of, you know, founder of a company. You know, this is not some, you know, um, shrinking violet kind of guy, right? Um, and then, and then you know, but then he couldn't cope with the severe tinnitus. And, and, but it gets to show you how these lifestyle diseases that are not, you know, lethal can actually be lethal, right? Yeah, they're very um, debilitating. Yeah, they're incredibly, you know, and I, the, the thing is, I always say is that we're entering a phase of medicine where we have to take into account quantity, quality of life because quantity of life is not enough. You know, you could be on a checkpoint inhibitor and live longer, but if you're having all sorts of complications and lifestyle issues, itching, whatever, uh, you know, it may not be worth living, right? Um, and I think that's uh, that's why I think this case kind of got to me and I thought it reminded me a lot of itch. And in tinnitus, essentially what happens is you lose your hearing. It's not that you get higher acuity of hearing and that's why you get the ringing in the ears. You actually lose your healthy hearing Mm -hmm. It gets muffled. And then the default becomes this really high pitched kind of ringing. It just essentially like that in the skin, you know, and I think also uh, more in the vestibular apparatus, uh, vertigo is like that. You lose your homeostasis and then the rim starts spinning. That's the default. Right. right? So I think, I think there's, there are common themes here across a lot of disease entities. And it's not ironic that every disease I'm talking about, look up the number of FDA approved drugs for them. It's, or it's somewhere averages between zero and one. Yeah. And these are like the most, like, they're very common, especially in the elderly population. And they're just debilitating and frustrating. And you can really lose your mind. Absolutely. And, you know, my patients average age about 72. You know, they worked hard their whole lives to get there, to now enter into what, you know, we refer to as the golden years and all that, right? And then they get hit with something like this. I mean, you, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, a tremendous amount of tragedy to, associated with that. So it sounds to me like itch can really get worse with age. Definitely. And is that, is, is this the main reason why that your sensory fibers are not working the same way they are when you're younger? You know, we don't know what the mechanisms are, but, uh, but what we, what, uh, it, but no question does an element of you know, primary neuronal nervous system intrinsic processes. There's no question. That's a universal about aging, right? Whether it's Alzheimer's or losing your vision, losing your hearing, losing your sensation, uh, losing your ability to control your bladder, right? Um, There's so many things that with aging that there's just neuro dysfunction. Now, the question is how much of that is truly neurocentric and is, is, is hastened or influenced by other things with aging, such as the alter, in the skin, the alteration of the barrier, the loss of the barrier, the thinning of the skin, and as well as the immune system. Uh, the, the other thing that's universally um, you know, true is as you, you age, your immune system starts to wane in certain ways. And it, it's, you know, I'm a neuroimmunologist. I always like to draw parallels between the nervous system and immune system, but similar to the nervous system where you lose homeostasis and by default, you get pathology. In the immune system, there's a very similar phenomenon. The homeostasis is a little different in the immune system. It's your ability to fight off everyday viruses and bacteria, which you invariably lose. And then by default, there's an outcrop of a very specific axis in the immune system, which is what we study, which is the type two immune system. So even if you didn't have allergy as a child and you have no history of atopic dermatitis, asthma, food allergy, none of these kind of hardwired allergic diseases, as you age, you start to actually develop this kind of, by default, these kind of allergic processes. Uh, they're much lower grade. So I think that, you know, the theme is that as you age, there's an imbalance that occurs across systems. And then they, in unfortunate coordinated fashion, amplify each other to, to then hasten the process of, um, you know, whether it's itch or what other co- kinds of neuro or neuroimmune dysfunction. 
Well, Dr. Kim, this has been a really interesting um, discussion about why we itch and the, uh, the knowledge behind and the science behind why we itch. So thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thanks so much, Hannah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Derm Club podcast. If you found the discussion today to be valuable, please subscribe and share. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode as we continue to delve into dermatology and skincare with the world experts.